Welcome. We're glad that you joined us tonight. Tonight, we're, our guests are Dr. William Johnson, the editor of the Adventist Review, the official organ of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, and Dr. Walter Martin, uh, who is well known for many of his writings on the cults, as well as the contemporary religious uh, philosophy today in our country. Gentlemen, we're glad that you're here. And I thought that on the topic of Seventh-day Adventism, uh, Dr. Johnson, the man that is sitting next to you, in your book that you put out in 57, Questions on Doctrine, that was the official statement of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination to non-Adventists, to the world in a sense, uh, there was a compliment to the guy sitting next to you, namely that you appreciated the fact that when he with other scholars from uh, uh, other non-Adventist churches came to you and asked questions, you appreciated the fact that he came to you directly he came to the denominations and, and, uh, denomination and did research. And Walter, I'd like for you to kind of go back as we start. Uh, how did you get into going to the denomination? What was that process and what happened? Well, I was doing research on the various cults of the time and uh, I'd written a book, The Rise of the Cults, and I received a, a letter from Leroy Froome, a uh, top Seventh-day Adventist scholar and um, historian, uh, the man who wrote The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers and other books. And uh, he took issue with me over the classification of Seventh-day Adventism as a cult. And uh, I contacted him back again. And uh, I said I was sorry he took issue, but that I had quite a bit of information which indicated to me that they were. And he said, well, it wasn't accurate. So I went to Dr. Barnhouse, who was the editor of Eternity magazine. I worked for Eternity at the time. And uh, I said, uh, this is a very responsible man. And uh, I think we ought to investigate this. And Dr. Barnhouse said, uh, oh, why don't you go down to Washington and talk with them? But I know they're a cult because I grew up in Mountain View, California, and I met with them all the time out there, and they were always giving me the mark of the beast and everything else. He <laughs> said, you're wasting your time. He said, don't, don't bother. But you went, I said, you went down to Washington. Oh, yeah. I went down there, and I met with uh, Roy Allen Anderson, who was the editor of the Ministry Magazine at the time and uh, the head of all Seventh-day Adventist ministers and missionaries throughout the world. And um, then uh, I met with W.E. Reed, who was a special consultant to the General Conference, Leroy Froome, and uh, T.E. Unruh, who had gotten the whole thing started by uh, discussing with us also in uh, Pennsylvania, where we were headquartered, uh, some of the things about Adventism. Tell us I, what your conclusion was. I came out with the conclusion in 1956. Uh, An Eternity magazine uh, came out with the conclusion that uh, Seventh-day Adventists who acknowledge the things that their denomination were telling us had to be regenerate Christians and evangelicals and could not be classified as a cult. Uh, however, there were Adventists that were on the uh, other side of the fence, and we recognized them too. We spent the time down there going over their literature, uh, which was a morass of contradictions. Uh, and materials that uh, could be juxtaposed back and forth, either cultic or non-cultic, depending upon who wrote it. We had to go through that with a whole group of scholars and men, men from their publishing houses and theologians to sift through all of the materials. And the result of it, uh, I propounded a series of questions to them. And the series was uh, later put into the book, which you mentioned before, Questions on Doctrine. It was the first time that a non-Adventist scholar an expert on the cults, had gone to the Adventists, sat down with them, discussed their theology openly, frankly, and freely. And I believe to this day, the men I dealt with on the co committee, and uh, Reuben Figuer, and the theologians who worked with us were thoroughly honest men. I, I was uh, just in theology, theological college, when uh, uh, Walter was uh, dialoguing with our leaders. And in fact, we, was, we studied questions on doctrine. I was 57, was my first year in school down in Avondale, Australia. And we went through that book very carefully. Uh, it was uh, applauded by the teachers there. And uh, then later I became a teacher. I taught for 20 years in the Adventist school system, lastly in the seminary for five years, where I was associate dean also. And that book has been highly regarded. Um, in terms of the controversy, John, there was some disagreement when it came out. It, um, Why? Why? What, what well, was the disagreement uh, about? 
Remember, I'm just uh, telling you what I've been told. Right. I wasn't around here in the States. Uh, one man in particular, M. L. Andreasen, was not invited to be part of the dialogue. He took strong exception to some of the things in there. I think the two that I've heard mentioned over and over have been um, the nature of Christ, the human nature of Christ, and then some statements relative to the atonement, the use of that word atonement. And um, he, he became quite uh, irate, I would say, and he sent out literature opposing the book, and uh, some people uh, agreed with him. He got a certain following. Uh, however, by and large, I don't think uh, that was a, a large following. Now, that's my assessment. In terms of the denomination stand on the book, we have not repudiated questions on doctrine. The book went through eight printings, 150,000 copies. Now, that's a lot of copies. Mm -hmm. um, it is still used in college classes. Um, some people feel it ought to be reprinted. Um, we can get into that. There is another theological volume, a Seventh-day Adventist biblical theology in process. And we can discuss that. I think that's a major reason why we are not reprinting questions on doctrine. But categorically, I can tell you, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church has not repudiated questions on doctrine. Okay. Well, let's plunge in here, Walter. Uh, uh, why don't you maybe start us off with some of the questions that you have already submitted to the, uh, the denomination, because you are saying that uh, you've heard some things and you are reassessing what you were told the first time around, as well as some of the, the, uh, the contemporary events that are happening right now. Where would you like to start tonight? I think that um, you have to begin with uh, the background we have already and also with the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist denomination today, uh, to whom I addressed my questions, responded quite differently than the denomination in 1956. How so? Um, in 1956, um, Reuben Figure, who considered questions on doctrine and the dialogue, he said, to be the most important single contribution of his entire tenure as president. Mm -hmm. Reuben Figure began to his later life to deplore the fact that there was a strong movement within Seventh-day Adventism to undercut what they had worked so hard to establish in questions on doctrine. And um, so I, after a number of ex-Adventist ministers came to me, after I received literally hundreds and hundreds of letters, documents, boxes full of documents from all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, England, the United States, you name it, they're stacked up that we had to go through uh, with people doing research on this subject. And they all were telling the same story, these ministers and these people all over the world. They were saying, we believe questions on doctrine. We cited questions on doctrine. We presented our views in the light of questions on doctrine and we were disfellowshipped, we were removed from the church. Uh, uh, I'm now painting houses and I was a former teacher. I was doing this, now I'm doing such and such. What, what went wrong? So I thought it would be a good idea to ask the question, what went wrong? So I addressed three questions to Neil Wilson. Who is the president, uh, the president of, the of the General Conference. Okay. Mr. Wilson didn't have time to discuss it with me, so he referred me to somebody else who didn't have apparently the time to discuss it either and they referred me to somebody else. By the time I did get a response, the first question, I asked three questions, three primary questions. I asked them uh, the question that I thought was tremendously important, which is, uh, do you still hold the questions on doctrine? And the answer was, yes. Same as uh, Mr. Johnson has said. Uh, I thought, that's strange. Uh, all these people can't be wrong, or something's wrong in the communication system. Second question, do you regard the teachings of Ellen G., the uh, interpretations of Ellen G. White of the Bible to be infallible? That is, the infallible rule of interpreting Scripture in your denomination. If, for instance, an issue comes up uh, where you're debating something, mm -hmm. and uh, Mrs. White speaks on it. Uh, is that the infallible voice? Is that the end of the debate? Is that, is that it? Uh, that question was conspicuously left unanswered. Um, and I was referred to uh, other materials which was rather super, were rather superficial. And um, I asked uh, a third question, uh, asked them about uh, questions on doctrine and uh, why the book went out of print. And uh, since then, I have formulated now 
a whole new series of questions. All right, we're going to get to those. What I would like to ask uh, Dr. Johnson is, uh, in my hand here, I have uh, just a portion of the Seventh-day Adventist workers, the former Seventh-day Adventist workers, ordained ministers, professors, men and women that have uh, been fired. And many of these folks have talked with me, many have talked with Dr. Martin, and uh, the main thing that I keep hearing is that uh, in some way they touched some of the doctrines of Ellen G. White. They disagreed from a biblical basis as far as they were concerned, and because of that they lost their job. I've done a rather careful study of this myself. Remember, I was in seminary, I was associate dean. Mm -hmm. I know these young fellows. I've been in Northern California where we have had a number of uh, our young fellows leave the ministry. Uh, I was in Australia in August and September of this year. In Australia, that figure is 60, 60 total. Well, I've got 100 that are actually documented right here to start with, and uh, I, I'm sure I could get the others for you. Uh, I'd be glad to give you this list here of 100. Is this from the United States, or does this include the figure from Australia? Uh, these look like these are all the United States. I'd be very interested to see it. Mm -hmm. so on my count, the figure in the United States is around 60 to 70. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, it is 60. This is an exact figure in Australia. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's you need to remember that in any year, this is over a four-year period, in any year in the ministry, there are young men and older men dropping out for, for various reasons. Uh, now, I, I grant that the number is much beyond what we would normally expect. We also have to remember that the worldwide um, employee count of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is 60,000. Well, I think we're talking about... The question I want to ask you is that why are the, the men, whatever that number is, it's substantial. The question is why is it that these men that are basically feeling that they're, they're holding with questions of doctrine, preaching the gospel, their conscience is held to the Bible, which seems to be part of the, uh, part of the creed that you're, you're holding there. Why is it that these men are being fired? Well, I don't see it just the way you do. You set it up there, John. I, uh, I grant you that in some places it may have happened the way you have described it. But I've talked to a number of these men, and uh, they are leaving the ministry for various reasons. Frankly, many had a very strong attachment to Dr. Desmond Ford. He taught a whole generation of ministers in Australia. Here in the United States, he taught for several years out in the West. He's a powerful preacher, charismatic uh, person, a uh, very fine Christian man, and his preaching has done much to, uh, to revive this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church. And uh, some have felt uh, sort of a sense of loyalty. And uh, with, with Ford falling out of uh, favor, his uh, particular interpretations of prophecy and so on, not being accepted by the church at large, they've identified with him. Uh, I don't, let me, I have not let me hold it right there yes. with, with Ford because we had uh, Des Ford here and when we had him here uh, I tried to push him as far as I could and he would not in any shape or form try to dent the denomination. I mean he was Ford 100%. Right. He, he really talked a lot like Luther in the Reformation. He wasn't going to leave the Catholic Church. He, he felt like he was getting kicked out. Okay. And in, in essence he was trying to support it. He just felt that the view concerning the 1844 investigative judgment was not biblical, spent pains here on the program as well as at Glacier View and other places to make that known. I've just listened to the debate that he had. And it seems like it's very, very biblical. Even if you disagree, is that a reason to kick him out? Well, let's look at it from another perspective. We have a statement of faith. There are 27 articles in our statement of faith. Here is a minister who feels he cannot support our statement of faith in all articles. Uh, now, the church members are paying his salary. He's being paid out of the tithe that they, they uh, are putting in week by week, month by month. You see, here is a question of conscience on his part. There's a question of uneasiness on the part of members. The, the church undertook a, a large-scale study. It went to huge expense and brought in scholars and uh, representatives from around the world, more than 100. We met for a week at Glacier View. We, uh, we heard from theirs, we studied his views, and uh, the church officially, in careful study, did not see light in his interpretations. Mm -hmm. Now, well, here's a man who is out of step in significant points with Adventist doctrine. And uh, Where would you say, Brother Johnson, uh, Des Ford's view of the sanctuary, 1844, the investigative judgment, etc., differs markedly from questions on doctrine? Oh, I think there are, there are certain uh, important differences. Well, where would you specify? Uh, in terms of prophecy, now, uh, Des, as, as I uh, understand him, 
um, has basically thrown out the historicist school of interpretation. It is uh, fulfillment either in the first century or right at the very end of time. But that's not sufficient ground for disfellowship. No, this is in terms of interpretation of prophecy, no. Okay. Uh, when it comes to um, 1844, uh, as I understand him, he would see that in terms of its significance for something that happens here on earth rather than something that happens in heaven above. And that is certainly a, a significant departure from questions on doctrine. Wasn't it part of the view all the way back to Ellen G. White that a person could disagree with the 1844 investigative judgment and that that was not grounds for disfellowshipping? Wasn't this part of your literature? That was well. pretty specifically stated that um, one by Mrs. White that you could have differences of opinion and um, uh, even about her role of authority in the church. And she was the uh, one who exercised the spirit of prophecy, allegedly. You could disagree with this and not yes. understand this and not be disfellowshipped from the church, she said. Now, how is it that Ford, uh, who, doesn't, uh, who has a very high view of Mrs. White and uh, who wrote your, probably one of your best books on the sanctuary, mm -hmm. Yay Thick, which you're still selling in some of your bookstores, Ford's own work on the subject, and you hailed him as an authority on the sanctuary and uh, on the investigative judgment. And Ford comes along and says, well, after some very careful study here, and in the light of questions, some of the things and questions on doctrine, I just don't happen to agree with this, and I'd like, you know, to deal with this issue. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, it's, it's far beyond, from what I'm getting in the mails, Des Ford and a group of men following Desmond Ford. These are people all over the place who are all having the same experience and are all getting very frustrated because every time they start asking questions, uh, they, they're not getting any answers on the subject. And it's very confusing. Uh, for instance, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. Um, I um, met with a committee at Loma Linda University. Uh, a number of individuals are there of high rank in the Adventist denomination. Not to name drop, but Robert Olson was there, and Roy Anderson was there, and a few others. And I was very concerned about the specific issue about the investigative judgment, the sanctuary, and so forth, and uh, particularly Mrs. White's role. And I asked the question at that time, the same question I asked the General Conference, is Mrs. White the infallible interpreter of Holy Scripture? And Robert Olson said, she is the authoritative voice. I said, infallible interpreter. That's the key. Mm -hmm. I said, because if Mrs. White is the infallible interpreter and you cannot disagree with her on the investigative judgments, on anything else, if that's true, then she has become a pope above the scriptures because who can now judge Mrs. White? The moment anybody quotes scripture to disagree with her, the denomination says you're controverting the spirit of prophecy. And so I said, what is the solution to the dilemma? If she's the infallible interpreter, nobody can judge her. If she's not the infallible interpreter, she's subject to the scripture, and all these men who are making just criticisms, exegesis and theories and so forth about it, are every bit as entitled to it as Mrs. White was. I got no answer at that meeting. I got no answer from the General Conference. I have no answer to date. Well, let Perhaps me give you, you my answer. I'll give you my answer. Yeah. She is not an infallible interpreter of Scripture. You're sure of that? I'm sure of it, yes. And that that, that and, is uh, your position or the denomination's position? I think we ought to go to the official statement of beliefs. And uh, if you want to find out what Seventh-day Adventists believe, I don't think it's fair to go to this person or that person. Go to the stated articles of belief. How about the Review and Herald? That's you editor. Review, I'm editor of that. Uh, Review and Herald, can I quote you? Review yeah, sure. and Herald, June 3rd, 1971. This is the Adventist Review you mean? It sure is. Quote, the Bible is an infallible guide, but it needs to be infallibly interpreted to avoid confusion and division. When will the people of God cease trusting their own wisdom? When will they come to the place where they will cease to measure, construe, and interpret by their own reason what God says to them through his appointed channel? Yeah. When we come to the place where we place no trust in man or in the wisdom of man, but unquestionably act, accept of an, of an act upon what God says through this gift, 
Then will the spirit of prophecy as set before us in the Bible and as witnessed in the present manifestation this gift, that's Ellen White, be confirmed among us and become in fact the counselor, guide, and final court of appeal among God's people. Close quote. That's Review and Herald. Right. Now, if she's the final court of appeal among God's people, if this present manifestation of the gift of prophecy is indeed what this very editorial says, then Mrs. White is the infallible interpreter of Scripture by your own publication. If that's true, Ford's right. This is one person's opinion. Okay. The Adventist Review, it is called the Adventist Review these oh, yes, days, I since 78. <laughs> the Adventist Review is not the official organ of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is the general church paper. I am editor. Nobody is looking over my shoulder and saying, print this, don't print this. If they don't like the work I do, they fire me. But the views in the Adventist Review uh, are the views of the editor and writers. I've been associated with the paper since 1980. This, I think, goes back to 1971. I you think weren't responsible for this. I was not responsible. I think it's very unfortunate. <laughs> yes. Uh, but again, uh, I think you should look at other things that I myself have written in the Adventist Review, where I, I state specifically that Ellen White's writings are not to be raised to the level of Scripture. They are not to be made a, an addition to the canon. I'd like to go back to the fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. But supposing you raise something to the level of Scripture without making it canonical. Supposing you say that something is equal with the Scriptures but not canonical Scripture. I think we'd be in a real problem there. We got the problem because Robert Olson says, it is clear that this investigative judgment is the correct interpretation of Scripture because Ellen White does endorse it, close quote. The spirit of prophecy is the only infallible interpreter of Bible principles since it is Christ through this agency giving the real meaning of his own words. Robert Olson, my topic this afternoon is on Ellen G. White as an inspired interpreter. Arthur White, Seventh-day Adventists are uniquely fortunate we are not left to find our way drawing our conclusions from the writings of 2,000 years and more ago that have come down to us through varied transcriptions and translations. With us, it is almost a contemporary matter. We have a prophet in our midst. Yeah, but what about the Holy Spirit? I mean, do we have to depend upon the spirit of prophecy, or is the Holy Spirit antecedent to the spirit of okay, prophecy? Okay, we've got uh, just about a minute left, so... Uh... I'd like to come to the fundamental beliefs. Okay, why don't you leave us with that, we'll come okay. back to it next week and, and following this up. But. Uh... Give us where you're coming from. All right. Uh, could I read the very sure. first article of belief? The Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God, given by divine inspiration through holy men of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this word, God has committed to man the knowledge essential for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the authoritative revealer of doctrines, and the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. And then later there is a statement with regard to the gift of prophecy. And you find this statement, they also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. And so I say, John, regardless of what individuals may have said here and there, these are the fundamental beliefs. Okay. And we have no pope, only these beliefs that only the church in general conference session can change. 15 only second then. comment, Walter, and then we've got to be gone here. Supposing Mrs. White says, you are to believe this, and an Adventist theologian says, this is incorrect exegesis. It's contrary to the Greek of the New Testament, and here's where it's wrong, A, B, C, D. Such as Des Ford. Or Des Ford, or uh, I could name some others. Grable. Uh, who have said it. Uh, and Mrs. White was wrong. She couldn't read Greek. She didn't know anything about the subject. And she taught something that was contrary to the Greek text of the New Testament. Now, if she's the infallible interpreter and she says, you believe it, are you going to accept what Mrs. White says or will you accept the Greek text of the New Testament? All right, that's, that's the question. We've got the doctrine on the board and we've got these questions. We're going to pursue this a little deeper next week. So please hang in there with us.